Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Playing It Safe, Your Commitment to Player Safety on the Ice. And thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us. My name is Michelle, and I'll be your host today. So as playoffs or end-of-season tournaments come to an end, this marks the start of another season as hockey associations across Canada start summer training programs and get started with registration for the new season ahead. So with that, you and your fellow coaches, trainers, managers, and parents are responsible for providing a safe and secure environment for players, both on and off the ice. So before we get started today, uh, a little bit about EPACT Network. Uh, so we are an online emergency network, free for families and individuals, that provides them with a single emergency record to safely and securely store key health and emergency contact details. This can be shared with organizations, such as hockey associations, that use the system to collect and manage information that's previously collected on paper. So things like emergency and medical information, or Hockey Canada medical release forms and waivers. So I'd like to introduce my co-host today, Matt Webb, who's our Director of Sales and Channel Development here at EPAC. Thanks for joining me today, Matt. Excellent. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, just to give everyone a little background on myself, uh, I've been with EPAC for uh, just over three years, and I oversee our direct sales team and sales channels here at EPAC. Uh, a fun random fact about myself, uh, in addition to working here at EPAC, I also run a, a sports photography company and have probably photographed, so I'd say, over 300 minor hockey games uh, in the last five years. So it's, uh, it's also interesting to have that perspective as well. Hey, that's a lot of hockey games. Um, and very cool. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Michelle. Uh, I'm the marketing manager here at EPAC. I joined the team in 2016. And one of my biggest passions overall in, as a marketing professional is uh, I really enjoy just creating marketing content, uh, and in EPAC's case, content that supports our users in their emergency and preparedness efforts, whether it's at work, um, the sports associations that they're associated with, uh, or just life in general. Um, and uh, my fun fact isn't as cool as Matt's. Um, I've played a number of varieties of hockey, I suppose, if we're keeping with the hockey theme today. Um, I'm originally from the UK, so I've played things like roller and skater hockey. I tried ice hockey and was pretty terrible at it, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, so moving on, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded, uh, and we'll be sending a copy of that recording through to everyone uh, following the session. Um, the audio should be coming through your computer or laptop speakers, depending on what you're listening on. And if you have a question at any point, we definitely encourage you to ask. Um, ask as it comes to mind uh, using the chat screen in the bottom left corner of your screen. And we set aside some Q&A time at the end of today's session, and we can answer those questions. If you are posting to social, either now or following today's webinar, uh, please use our hashtag PlayItSafe, and you can find us on Twitter at EPACT Network, um, and uh, we'll, we'll chat with you there as well. And also, we'd love your feedback. So when today's webinar is over, you'll see a short survey. Survey will pop up on your screen, and it'll just take a couple of minutes of your time. We appreciate you taking that time to fill it out, and then that allows us to continue bringing you relevant content for the future. So a couple of key takeaways uh, following today. Uh, some best practices to keep safety top of mind uh, throughout your association on or off the ice, in the locker room, on the bench, home games, away games. And we're going to uncover some challenges and concerns that are common to hockey associations uh, across North America. So get, getting started with our best practices. So hockey can be fast and furious, and with that comes player contact, uh, intentional or otherwise, uh, falls, flying pucks, there's loose sticks, and it's generally overall a strenuous activity. So we have no doubt that your hockey association works really hard to ensure the safety of your players due to the nature of the game. It's not always possible to stop or prevent every incident. So we put together some general best practices and considerations as you embark on your next season. So let's get started. So first, Probably one of the most obvious ones when it comes to a hockey association is encouraging the use of proper equipment. And with that, there's a few things that are probably going to come top of mind more than anything else. So obviously a helmet that fits well is going to be one of the easiest ways to prevent injuries and concussions. So a couple of top tips for helmets. 
Um, they should fit snugly on a player so that they don't shift while skating around. Um, and those chin straps should fit firmly under the chin as it keeps, obviously the, keeps the helmet on and tight while playing. And when it comes to buying, whether, whether a parent is buying new or gently used equipment, it's important to check that the helmet is Hockey Equipment Certification Council approved or HECC approved uh, and in good condition. So that will let you know that you're buying a good quality helmet and that it's going to do what it's designed to do. Skates should fit properly too. That will help not only avoid discomfort, but also helps the player move um, and can help avoid potential injuries too. So a couple of key things there are making sure that players are using skates with ample ankle support. Um, things like steel or hard plastic toe cups are really great for protecting feet from any low, fast flying pucks uh, that might, might be moving around. And we like to encourage players to get their skates sharpened every five to ten games. Um, that keeps blades sharp and allows for smooth skating, good gameplay, and uh, then blades are actually less likely to get caught in ruts in the ice as a result. Um, also want to make sure that shoulder, elbow, knee, and shin pads are specific for use in hockey. Um, equipment designed for other sports isn't actually going to hold up in hockey, not only because the players are not necessarily going to have the protection they need, um, gear might not actually cover key areas of the body properly, and in hockey, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, so gloves are actually also another item specific to the sport. Those should provide proper protection all across the hand and wrist, but also should allow for mobility of the wrist too, um, to allow the player to, uh, to take part in the game. Um, minor hockey players are actually required to wear face masks during play, um, but we encourage to, them to wear a mouth guard as well. Um, and that would actually even go for older players too, um, whether they're using a face guard or not. Um, but face masks don't actually prevent injuries to the head or teeth, and a mouth guard can actually help prevent neck injuries too, um, and it does play a part in um, uh, helping to prevent and uh, deal with other head injuries like concussions. Um, and while you can buy these in most general stores, if your young players, or any player for that matter, gets one fit specifically to them, that means it's actually more comfortable and then they're more likely to wear it. And obviously that makes encouraging that uh, a, a lot easier. Um, and then we can't forget goalies. They're putting themselves between flying pucks and the goal. Um, so making sure that goalies have equipment that is specific to their position is obviously really important as well. So they have some differences in their equipment, leg pads, arm pads, chest protectors. They're all much thicker than regular player pads, and they should actually be the right length to make sure that there's full coverage across the goalie's body. And then blocker and catcher gloves should be safe and functional. So obviously they're going to be needing to use them, but making sure that the goalie can continue to stop pucks while things like hands, wrists um, are well protected as well. So moving on, our next best practice is being prepared on and off the ice. Uh, so you know, so much of hockey is uh, is a mixture of both. So these best practices, starting with some in-season conditioning camps and practices, they're really important in training for games. Uh, conditioning helps prepare each child for the physicality of play, and also ensures that they get in shape and stay in shape for competitive games too. So it's keeping their physical levels in tip-top shape. Um, make sure that all players get proper stretching in. Uh, this is really important for muscle groups, for specific muscle groups that are used within hockey. So hip and groin, back and torso, and hamstrings. So making sure that hockey players are, are stretching the, the most important muscle groups there. And then connecting parents and players with skate clinics can actually help refine skating skills. So that gets new players comfortable on the ice. They may not have, have skated competitively or in a team sport before. Um, and it also helps to refine skills uh, on an ongoing basis, um, which can actually help with safety. We've got more comfortable, skilled players skating around. Uh, ensuring that everyone has the proper first aid and CPR training. This can support anyone in the case of an emergency, player, parent, member of staff. Um, and it might be good to encourage parents to get certified too. Uh, so here in Canada, the Canadian Red Cross does a lot of courses. Uh, St. John's Ambulance does as well. Um, and you'll probably find that there's some um, smaller or privately named companies that can actually uh, provide you with certification or your staff with certification as well. And then 
ensuring that necessary safety equipment is always available and accessible. So first and obvious is a first aid kit, uh, making sure that that's easily to hand if needed. Um, but also it's something to think about when it comes to extra medication. So things like EpiPens for players who may have specific medical issues or allergies. Um, because those can be unpredictable, it's usually good to have things like that to hand just in case uh, you know, uh, an allergy occurs um, while a player is training or playing. Uh, and make sure you have important medical and emergency information for all your players overall. Um, you want to make sure that this is easily accessible in an emergency, whether it's a team manager that needs to access it, or if something more serious occurs, medical professionals so like paramedics or, or a doctor. And you want to make sure that uh, this information, being that it's medical, it's sensitive information, is properly secured while it's not in use, especially if it's kept on the bench during training or games, or if it's being moved around, if you're on the bus going to away games or tournaments, uh, keep that information uh, safe and secure at all times. So best practice number three is collect and manage the right information for players. So this follows on from that uh, emergency and medical information piece. Um, and one of the primary things is in any sports uh, is making sure that you have emergency contact information for each player. Um, this actually can include pickup details as well. So if there's a, an emergency or the arena is evacuated for some reason um, and a child's parents uh, don't happen to be there, uh, you can make sure that you have that information to hand so you know that if a child is going home with somebody else that they're approved and authorized to go home with that individual. Uh, having allergy information, as mentioned before, allergies can be really unpredictable um, and they can strike at any time. Uh, so should a player experience a reaction either on the bench or in the locker room, having that information to hand as well as necessary equipment or medication, so again, going back to EpiPens or specific medication, can help a player immediately uh, or until medical assistance arrives if it escalates to that level. Um, and one that's maybe not thought of immediately is collecting dietary information. So obviously most players aren't likely to encounter food while playing, um, but if a team is attending away games or they're at a tournament that goes on for uh, you know, overnight or over a weekend, it might be a good idea to collect things like dietary information and have that information ahead of time that can help with planning and logistics based on wherever you're going or spending the, the weekend or the evening. Um, concussion information. So concussions are a reality for high impact sports, including hockey, and it's actually an injury that most parents are concerned about when it comes to the safety of their children, and that's across a number of sports. So football and rugby are obviously included in that as well. And concussion management overall is an important part of athlete care. Uh, so having that concussion history, their baseline test results, having those available and easily accessible can help coaching staff adjust training and play for affected players to make sure that they're not returning to the ice too soon um, and that, uh, that they can keep a, a specific eye on them as well. And then consents and waivers. So with team sports, many organizations implement things like codes of conduct or behavioral consents to ensure that every player has a positive experience while on the ice. Um, so collecting those and again having those to hand is also really important. And sometimes understanding phobias or particular behavioral issues ahead of time can actually help coaching staff have a more complete understanding of a child's needs and then they can provide the appropriate support through training or games um, so everybody's getting the most positive experience. And our next best practice is actually reviewing if you have, or ensuring if you don't, that there is a risk management plan in place. Um, getting started on that at any point is always a good idea. So again, making sure that you have emergency and medical information for each player and that it's easy, easily accessible. So for us here at EPAC, uh, if you were to use a tool like ours, we have um, our admin app, and that allows anyone authorized to access records, whether they have a data or a cellular connection. So in this case, it's perfect for those arenas that basically have no cell signal when you're in there. Um, and that means that information is to hand. You don't need to carry around a lot of paper. However, if you don't have access to a smartphone, you will want to have either another electronic uh, version of those records, so either on a laptop and a USB stick, secured of course, um, or paper backups. Um, just in case. And again, whichever option you're using, make sure that that information is secure. 
and probably a, a really significant one or one that makes this process um, a lot easier is appointing a risk manager to be a, your association's point person on safety. So they should be qualified in safety programs that are applicable to your organization or your league. Some have very specific ones, others are just general safety programs. They can coordinate and facilitate safety clinics for players and their families. And that keeps safety top of mind for everyone. Everyone's working to the same rules and understandings and learning. Uh, they can actually complete regular arena safety checks on any facilities that the team uses. So whether it's the home facilities or wave facilities, you have somebody who has that expert eye. And they can inform facility managers also of any injuries that might arise because of hazards in that particular arena as well. Uh, they should also establish protocols for handling things like injury report forms um, or serious injuries occurring during practice or game events. They're going to be that go-to person. And they're actually also responsible for the association's emergency action plan as well. So that stuff is pretty much laid out and ready to go. And, and just to add to that as well, I mean, when it comes to collecting the emergency contact information, that part of it is critical because regardless of whether or not it's for, say, the regular season or even just for tryouts, that information uh, becomes imperative. And, and one thing that I always suggest is ensure that emergency contacts are somehow notified when they're listed as an emergency contact for someone. So what can happen is an aunt or say even an uncle, they're listed as an emergency contact and they're not told they're an emergency contact and suddenly that person is out of the country throughout the course of that season. If you guys have registration tools that are uh, built within your association that allow you to communicate with parents and emergency contacts, it's always a good idea to use those to connect with those key members of a family support network. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Well, actually, that's a, a really great conclusion to our best practices uh, section. So I am actually just going to leave it with Matt to explore some of the challenges that hockey associations may face throughout the season. Perfect. Thanks, Michelle. The biggest challenge for most minor hockey associations today is that most of this information is still being collected on paper. And not only is that labor intensive for coaches and for managers and for trainers, but it's also very time consuming for parents. And I, I'm sure we probably have some parents on tonight's webinar that can relate to the pain of having to fill out these forms. Um, even as a coach, I know there's a lot of forms that go along with being a volunteer. And I mean, in addition to this process being time consuming for everyone, it also presents a significant risk for your association. If, let's say, one of the staff, you know, as a coach or as a manager or even one of the players had required immediate medical attention, the last thing you want to do is hold up emergency services because you're busy searching for their medical history or an emergency contact phone number in a stack of paper forms. And, you know, I, I always think of the scenario, even just playing hockey as a kid, you know, if, if I get called up to another team, and I play for that other team for a weekend, that paper form does not follow me to that other team. Because usually what happens is there's just the one copy. So you know, that results in those coaching staff or those managers or trainers not having access to any of that medical or emergency information for that player. Now, emergencies are considered emergencies because they're unexpected. Uh, which is why the collection of all these critical details is so important for any association. In a medical emergency, either outdated prescriptions or old medical conditions could greatly affect the treatment that an individual receives. If a player needs to be picked up from a game or a practice, inaccurate contact information for those emergency contacts that Michelle was talking about could mean that that child either doesn't get picked up or is, is maybe even picked up by someone who's no longer considered an emergency contact. And when it comes to all this information, when it comes to the medical and the emergency contact information, these details can change quickly. Uh, we actually conducted a, a study uh, about three years ago and found that over a period of four months, more than 30% of these forms fall out of date. And if this, must, if this information does change, it also requires a very tedious process of obtaining a new form from that parent, from that guardian, 
and then having to uh, manually update that existing form. And for a player that might be out on the ice, that's maybe traveling for a tournament, that can create issues in not getting that information back to the right people at the right time. All the emergency information and the medical information should always be easily and quickly accessible so that as a coach, as a, as a manager, or as a trainer, that they can respond to any unexpected situation. When reviewing your processes as an association, it's really important to consider the following. So consider who has access to this information, but then also look at, well, how long would it take them to access that information and review it? If you are collecting this information on paper forms, um, is it easy for coaches and managers, managers to quickly find that information in a binder or even in an envelope that might be filled with lots of these forms? And lastly, is that information that you've collected from parents both legible and complete? Oftentimes what happens is these parents are filling these forms out so many times throughout the year. They're doing it for hockey, they're doing it for baseball, for school. And they may sometimes forget to answer those questions or they'll rush through it and you can't even read their writing. And it's, it's important that that information is clear and concise, especially if that's being passed off to emergency services. Uh, research has actually showed us that on average, it can take upwards of five minutes to find that information if it's being stored on paper. And you can think about the impact that that would have on the well-being of any of your players. We probably don't have to tell anyone on this call tonight how critical the security and privacy of this information is. Whether you're using an online system or using paper forms to collect medical and emergency information, you do want to ask yourself the following questions. So who has access to this information? Only the coaches and players for that team should have access to the, the players that pertain to their team. It should not be open to anyone and should not be easily accessible by anyone as well. Is that information also secure with a password or even a physical lock? Um, whether that information is accessible at training or out at an away game, it should always be secure. And is your system compliant with privacy laws within your region? So of course within Canada we have PAPITA, but then we also have certain privacy laws such as FOIPA in BC. And you also want to look at, at the end of a season, is there a way for you to quickly remove a coach's or a manager's access to all that information once the season has wrapped up? Unless you are required to archive all that information, um, which most hockey associations in Canada are not, you also, you also want to ensure that all that information can quickly be destroyed uh, at the end of every season. So is there a process in place where you're collecting those forms back from every single trainer and every single coach at the end of that season? In, in summary, I, I just want to leave a few key takeaways to keep top of mind. And I know I'm talking about security over and over, but it, it really is important that you ensure that any system you're using is going to be compliant with privacy laws, and that those systems, even if it's an internal system, that you guys are conducting regular security audits. Um, I, I know for us, because of the sensitivity of the information that associations collect with EPACT, we're required to go through a very thorough safety audit every single year to ensure that we're meeting government compliances and are up to date with any new security measures. If you will, or if you do plan to collect this information online, uh, make sure that you have those appropriate security measures in place. Any online form, whether it's for medical information or even for just simple registration, those forms should always be hosted on a secure site that is going to be equipped with industry standard SSL data encryption. And what that means is that it ensures that any data that's being passed between your systems and your customers' computers will be encrypted. And be sure that prior to the start of your season, each team, every, everyone under your association is going to be accessing the most up-to-date information. One way to help out with this, actually, is to send an email out to all your parents. This could be done at the team level or even at the association level, but send an email out to all the parents at the prior, or sorry, at the start of the season 
just asking them to notify you or notify their coach of any changes to that player's information, um, especially if that player may have suffered a concussion throughout the course of the summer. And be sure that this information is only accessible by those authorized people that we talked about. So ensure that only the coach, the manager, or even the safety person for that one team is only able to access the details for the players on their team. If you're collecting this information on paper forms, uh, perhaps one idea is to have at least two copies. So one for your coaches, one for your managers, uh, but then also one to keep behind uh, in a secure location, um, potentially within maybe uh, the association's office. And if you are collecting the information electronically and online, just be sure that all your staff, all your coaches and managers are fully trained on that system. In the event of any emergency, whether it's uh, an injury, uh, you know, an allergic reaction at a team party, every second is going to count. So it's imperative that you're able to access this information as quickly as possible. So these would be some of the most common challenges that we've heard from some of our existing customers and other minor hockey associations across Canada. So what I'll do now is hand it back to Michelle for a little Q&A. Awesome. Thanks for all that great info, Matt. Um, so I'm just going to go through, as promised, a couple of questions that have come in uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, so I think the first one we'll do, uh, with all the concerns about data breaches, how can we be sure that information stored online is safe? Um, I mean, I can start, Matt, if you want to sort of jump in at any mm -hmm. point. Um, when it comes to capturing this type of information online, you know, Matt, Matt's mentioned it plenty of times, that it's really critical to ensure that only the right people or authorized staff have access to this information. Um, and that's a key component to how Pepito work, compliancy works in Canada. Um, and it's also really important for collecting that personally identifying information online. So in this case, it's that medical or emergency information that, that really identifies a player. Mm -hmm. and, and just to add to that, I know it might sound like a, a broken record, but you know, also if you are collecting that information online, you know, it, ensure that within that system at the end of the season or even you know, at the end of a, a, a weekend tournament, if it's a coach that's just helping out, and you want to make sure that coach has access all those details. Just, just ensure that there's a way to easily um, disconnect that coach or that, that team manager so that at the end of the season, at the end of that, that tournament, they no longer have access to that information. Awesome. Um, and I think we just have time for one more. Um, uh, how can we speed up communications? So, you know, a lot of concerns, whether it's from parents or coaches, um, or to, you know, team staff is that you know you're in an arena and there's little to no cell signal or parents are available. Um, but on the off chance that parents are not available, if it's a practice that the children are being dropped off at, having multiple ways to reach parents or guardians or emergency contacts or all three um, is probably the best way to get a hold of somebody quickly in an emergency if you have to do so. Um, even if it's something like a location change or mm -hmm. you know, the, the team is out uh, on the bus to an away game and the bus gets a flat tire so they're going to be late home or there, um, just having a way to quickly get information out is, is, is really key. So here at EPAC, just a couple of ways that we do things here, and I mean you can do it within, it, within your own systems or processes that you have. So we use three available forms of communication to help in situations like that. Uh, we have email messaging, um, voice messaging, and text messaging. So we can, I think, quite confidently assume that at least one of those forms of messages will get through to the intended recipient. So uh, we're kind of covering, we call that redundant communications, um, and that helps get the right information to the right people at the right time. And there's also tools I know that individual teams use. Um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with TeamSnap. So that's always a good tool as well at the team level for someone to take the lead on, uh, and it can be an effective communication tool as well. Awesome. I didn't know that. I learned something new today. Awesome. Well, that actually brings us to the end of our webinar time today. Uh, please do hang around for just a few moments to complete our survey. It will pop up automatically on your screen, so you don't have to do anything other than take a couple of minutes to fill out the questions there. As I said before, we really appreciate your feedback. 
if you would like to learn more about how EPACT can help your hockey association, you can actually reach Matt directly via email or telephone, whichever is more convenient for you. His information is on screen now. And just wanted to thank you all again for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon on one of our future webinars. Thank you, everyone.